we'll uh, turn together in God's Word tonight to Mark 10, verses 17 through 31. Mark 10, verse 17 through 31. Mark 10, beginning in verse 17, where God's Word reads as follows. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. So far, the reading from God's word this evening, may he add its blessing to our hearts. As I was thinking about this rich young ruler uh, that appears in our text this evening, I thought of somebody to whom we could compare him in our own setting. And the man that came to my mind was Elon Musk. He is the second richest man in all the world. And uh, doing a quick search on his net worth, I found that his net worth is about $180 billion. That's a lot of money. And if you could convert all of his assets <clears throat> into cash with the values of the home in the Augusta area, he could buy 1 million houses in Augusta, Georgia. Now, there are not 1 million houses in Augusta, Georgia. So that, may, that means that Elon Musk, in his wealth, could buy all the houses in Augusta, Richmond County, 11 times. That's how rich this man is. Now, I am pretty sure that nobody here in this room can even imagine having access to that amount of money. And maybe we are being tempted at this point to say, if I had that much money... Pretty sure a lot of my problems would be solved. In fact, it's difficult for me to imagine if there is anything that could possibly be better than to have access to that amount of money. Well, is that true? Well, Jesus says it's not true. And the rich young ruler actually demonstrates that this is not true. Because what we have before us tonight is an account of a man who seems to have it all, a man who is successful at a very, very young age, but who actually has nothing. And that's the reality of, of life. Not everything is as it appears. Earthly riches, though they can be seen as a great thing to be pursued, they can actually mean heavenly doom. Now, it doesn't always mean heavenly doom, but it can mean heavenly doom. Something that we assess as wonderful can actually be to the detriment of a person. And that is a great terror indeed. What we see in this text is this lesson that really is applied to more than just riches, more than just a, a, a big bank account. It's really 
a lesson that applies to anything, anything and everything that, that is more important to you than Christ, something that, yeah, that you love more than Christ, and anything that you identify that way. This, this lesson from God's Word teaches us that those things that we love so much actually become a detriment to our soul. And so as we look at this lesson about the rich young ruler, what we see from God's word is, th is that a man who gains the treasure of Christ forsakes all other loves. A man who gains the treasure of Christ forsakes all other loves. And to learn that lesson, we want to look at this life, this rich young ruler, first of all, by looking at his question, then second of all, looking at Jesus' answers, and third of all, looking at what Jesus teaches beyond the life of the rich young ruler. So, a man who gains treasure of Christ forsakes who gains the treasure of Christ forsakes all others. We're going to see the rich man's question, Jesus answers and Jesus teaching. So, let's begin by looking at the rich man's question in verse 17. The man, make no mistake about it, the man who comes to Christ in this account is a man of great achievement. He is a he is a successful man. He is a he is not only a successful man, but he is also a man who has even much more promise than what he has established already. In verse 22, we see that this man had great possessions, so he was a rich man. If you compare this text to the, the mirror account in Luke's gospel in chapter 18, when you look at verse 18 of that text, you see that this man was a ruler. So not only was he wealthy, but he was a man who had within him his office, a position of leadership. He had authority. So he was rich and he was powerful. And so that makes him a prodigy of sorts because we also know from Matthew's account of this same story, the same account of this rich young ruler in verse 20, we see that he is a young man. So there are three parts of this young man's life that we can all put together to see that he was very successful at a very early age. He was, he was young, he was rich, and he was powerful. And so all of these pieces come together in this young man, meaning that he not only is successful in the present, but because of his youth, he actually has promise. He has many, many more things that he can achieve, and his early success seems to indicate that that there, there is much to hope for from this man's life. But there is something that this man is missing. This man is not satisfied with his life. He has riches. He has power. He is young enough to enjoy all those things. But his question shows that there's something eating away at him. There's something that is missing in his life. Now, what does this uh, rich young ruler ask of Jesus? He comes to Jesus, he says, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? There's something in the back of his mind that will not go away, and it's this. What happens to me when I die? What happens to me when I breathe my last? Though this young man has the things that we often are told will make us happy, he is looking for something else. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, what's noticeable about this man's question is that he is coming to Christ operating as if he were under a covenant of works. Now, we've talked about that some in the morning service. Just by way of review, the covenant of works is pre-fall. God giving his, his gracious promise to Adam and Eve in the garden, promising life on perfect, personal, perpetual obedience of all of God's commandments. And that was manifested through this one commandment. You will not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the moment that Adam and Eve transgressed against that simple instruction was the moment that death entered into the world. But this young ruler is coming to Jesus operating under those principles, asking what he can do to inherit eternal life. Clearly, he's, he's not reading Genesis 15, verse 6, which he would have had access to as a, as a man who, who lived after the writing of the Pentateuch. 
he, he's not reading about how Abraham's faith was counting to him as righteousness. No, he's coming to Christ seeking what he can do in order to earn eternal life. It's actually clearer even in Matthew's gospel. In Matthew uh, 19, verse 16, he says, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? So he's not asking, uh, what is the way of salvation? He's not asking for information. He's already decided what the way of salvation is. The way of salvation is to do something. What good deed must I do, says this man? So he is coming to Christ as if he is under a covenant of works. He's coming, seeking how he can do everything by himself so that God would give him his wages, contrary to what we were looking at this morning. He wants to earn his own eternal life, in other words. And of course, there are times when the world behaves in this way and causes the Christian to think in that way as well. This is the way of a religious person who is void of an understanding of Christ. This is the way of a Pharisee, uh, the way of a person who lays requirements on top of what the Bible teaches. This is a person who says, faith in Christ plus something else. The Galatian church stumbled into the error of this rich young ruler, where they said Christ plus circumcision means salvation. And what Jesus, what we see in this man's question is, is that same kind of mentality, that I come to God, but I come to God with my works so that I will have eternal life. But Christ plus any work at all is a false gospel. Uh, Paul, in the book of Galatians, responding to this, this requirement for circumcision that was present in the Galatian church, he says, look, I, Paul, say to you in Galatians 5, verse 2, that if you accept circumcision, the, the, the implication on these terms, if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. What's Paul saying? He's saying, you add works, the smallest work, to Christ and salvation, and Christ is cast out altogether. The smallest work added to salvation means that it is all of works. Because if you have Christ and you don't have the work, then you don't have salvation. You must have the work to have salvation. I'm not saying that's right. I'm saying that's the consequence of that kind of, of thinking. So if you add any works to your salvation, you have no salvation at all. And that's the question that this young man is asking. He's saying, what good work must I do to be saved? It's a, not a surprising question to come from a, from a high achiever. It's not a surprising question to come from somebody who is, who is self-disciplined, who who, who, who is able to accomplish much, and, and all this rich young ruler has done is, is carry over his earthly successes into the area of salvation. Now, like we said at the beginning, no doubt this young man was remarkable. He is a ruler, he is rich, and he is young. And so he has reasons for self-confidence. But when it comes to the gospel, and when it comes to eternal life, the worldly doctrine of self-confidence actually destroys the gospel. And that's what we see in Jesus' answer. This man questions, asks what he must do to inherit eternal life, and Jesus responds and answers this young man uh, for his question. Now, Jesus doesn't answer this young man in a way that you might expect. Jesus answers this young man by, by asking three, or by, he answers this man's question with, with three corresponding points. He appeals to three different aspects of this man. And he does that in verses 18 through 22. So first of all, we see in verse 18, Jesus appealing to his nature. Jesus responds to the man, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. So Jesus here is picking up on the part of the question, uh, the introduction really to this young man's question where he says, good teacher, what must I do? And Jesus is picking up on that opening address, good teacher. And Jesus is using that address to direct this man towards God. This young man is a respecter of persons. 
He doesn't, he's not coming to Christ to worship him. That's not why he's coming to Christ. He's coming to Christ as a respected rabbi to hear what he has to say. Now, Jesus answers him, why do you call me good? That does not imply that Jesus isn't actually good. He's responding to this man at the point where he is thinking. This man is thinking of Jesus as only a man. And we've been seeing in the Gospel of Mark that the point of Mark is that Jesus isn't merely a man. He is more than a man. But here this man is operating with Christ as if he were only a man. And Jesus is pointing him away from humanity and making him look at divinity. That's where he's directing this man. So this man is saying, good teacher. Jesus is saying, why are you calling me good? There's only one place to look if you want goodness. And it is not in any rabbi according to your perception. There is only one good, and that is God. Now, Christ is good, but he's directing him to God. This man is not addressing Christ because he's God in the flesh, come to live a perfect life, come to die for the sins and guilt of the people. He is addressing Christ in the opposite way. He is coming to Christ, looking for salvation, not in the goodness of God at all. This man is looking for salvation in his own strength, in his own flesh. So he is coming to this teacher who he perceives to be good, asking for the secret sauce that will make him good on his own. Now Jesus, in deflecting attention away from himself and towards divinity, directing him towards God, is turning this man's attention away from himself, pointing out to him, that he has no standing at all to ask such a question. No man does. No man is good. God is good. So if we are looking for goodness, we're looking in the wrong place if we're looking in any man, including ourselves. So this rich young ruler, as successful as he is, he is a man. And that means he is not good. So Jesus, in some sense, in answering his question, is appealing to his nature. He is, by nature, a man. He is flesh and blood. He is not good, but he is by nature corrupted in sin because of the sin of Adam and Eve at the minimum. And then you add to that his own transgressions. And that's where Jesus goes next. He, he appeals to the law. So he appeals to his nature and he appeals to the law. After pointing out that no one is good but God alone, Jesus cites the commandment. Now, if this situation arose today, I think the modern church would be tempted to skip this step to skip this step of presenting the law to this man. I think the, the modern church would be tempted to start telling this man about God's mercy. He would, the modern church would be tempted to begin by talking to this man about the grace of salvation, but Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus doesn't talk to him about, well, you must, in order to be saved, you must, you must humble yourself before the Lord, receive, the, receive salvation from Christ by faith. He, he doesn't do that. Jesus, Jesus presents to him the second table of the law the fifth through the ninth commandments. And he actually adds an application of the eighth commandment. So, so he, he talks to him about the fifth through the ninth. He adds to it, do not defraud. Now, why would Christ do that? Why would he not just go straight, straight into telling this man about the way of salvation? Isn't that what the man asked him about? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, actually, that's not what the man asked him about. The man asked him exactly what Jesus is answering him. The man asked him what he must do to inherit eternal life, and Jesus points him to the law. Well, Jesus, in doing that, is addressing this man at the need of his heart. This man is coming to Christ with the assumption that he can do something to merit eternal life. And so he is coming to Jesus as if he is under the covenant of works, and Jesus answers him in the same way. Under the covenant of works, you would direct a person to law. You would direct a person to what they must do in order to have life. You want to live? Well, here are God's commandments. You have to abide by them all. And this is what we would talk about as the first use of the law. There are different ways that God uses the law. Uh, the God uses the law in the unbeliever, first of all, to convict them of sin, to show them their need for Christ, to humble them, to hold it up as a mirror of sorts, to say, look at you fallen short. This is, 
what you've said you want to do, but you've fallen short. You've not, uh, you've not reached to the level of perfect, personal, perpetual obedience to these commandments that I have set before you. And so that's what Jesus presents to this man, to show him his sin, to show him that he needs something besides himself and his good works. So the flow of Jesus' answer so far is that no man is good, appealing to the man's nature, and no man does good, appealing to the law. And this is the perfect way, because Christ did it, this is the perfect way to talk to the self-righteous person. Of course, there are some who are crushed under the weight of their sin, and you don't have to pile more weight on them when they're already in that state. But for the person who is proud and, and lifted up, instead of the balm of the gospel, what they need is conviction of sin from the law. Now, usually man starts with the law uh, in terms of trying to justify himself. Uh, and Jesus points him to that to show him his failing in front of the law. But even though Jesus' question is perfect and good, it has no effect on this man at all. What does he say uh, as he interacts with Jesus? In verse 20, teacher, he says, all these I have kept from my youth. Imagine that kind of statement. The level of self-deception that this man must be under, that he thinks he has kept the commandments of God from his youth. He is a, a self-deceived man who is being shown his deficit as he is being faced with the law, but he is completely blind to it. Jesus is saying to this man, you are not good and you do no good. And this man says, oh, yes, I do. I have done all of these things from my youth. So lastly, what Jesus does in his answer is appeal to this man's heart. So he's appealed to his nature. He appeals to the law. And now he appeals to this man's heart. The law, in some sense, is meaningless if you consider it only in terms of action. Uh, this morning, as our call to confession, we considered one of Jesus' summaries of the law. There's another summary in Mark 20 where, where Jesus charges us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So that is a summary of the law, and that's where Jesus goes next. Jesus next zeroes in on this man's affections. What's behind? He, he doesn't dispute with the man that he actually has kept the commandments from his youth. He hasn't. But Jesus doesn't get in a yes, you did, no, you didn't dispute with this man. He simply moves on to the next level. He goes underneath the keeping of the law and points out to this man what his heart is like. Jesus pinpoints the exact place in this man's heart to show him that he is lost. Now, that is not unloving. Jesus doesn't do that to be mean to this rich young ruler. In, Verse 21, what does it say? Jesus looked at him and loved him. So because Jesus loves this man, he doesn't let him get away with his self-deception. It is, it, is it, is, it is not unloving to confront a man with a wrong notion of who he is. It is, it is actually loving to confront a person with his self-deception. Now, okay, what does that mean? That means... That when you speak the truth to a person who has asked you to speak into their life in this way especially, your statement of the truth may offend. And your statement of the truth may cause sadness. But as Jesus is invited and as he faces this rich young ruler, it would not be helpful or merciful or kind to conceal the truth from this young man. Now, what, what I am not saying is, when you are speaking into a person's life about a place where they are self-deceived, the more offensive you can be, the better off you are. That is not what I'm saying. That is how some people take it, but that is not what I'm saying, and that's not how Jesus behaves. Jesus speaks the truth, which makes the man sad, but Jesus doesn't speak with the intent of offending. He speaks with the intent of healing. That's Jesus' intent. And so, this man is being confronted with the truth that he is missing. Jesus is pointing this man to his first love. 
Jesus is pointing this man to his idol, which is his riches. His riches are, are his idol. And, and Jesus points him to that when he challenges him in verse 21 uh, to sell everything that he has, to give it to the poor, and to follow him. This, that is disheartening to this man. He, he goes away sorrowful because, well, he was a rich man and, and he didn't want to part with his riches. Uh, the, the, the thing that is missing in this man's life is being willing to forsake his riches for the purpose of following after God. His first love is demonstrated in his response. He doesn't merit eternal life because he loves an idol more than God. He is not willing to follow Christ. He loves his wealth, and he loves it most of all. So this man is looking for salvation by works, and he is shown by Christ that it is not possible. Christ shows it to him by appealing to his nature, by appealing to the law, and by appealing to his heart. He sets before this man this picture that you must pursue God, you must forsake whatever competes with him, and this rich young ruler is unwilling to do that. He, he is unwilling to give that up. And after the rich man leaves in verse 21, in verses 23 and following, Jesus picks up and uses this rich man as an object lesson for his disciples who remain. And what Jesus begins talking about is the difficulty of rich people to enter into the kingdom of God. He says it in verse 23 and again in verse 24, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, in verse 25, he says, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Now, you get into commentaries and they have all sorts of fancy explanations about what that means that has to do with city gates and camels having to get down on their knees and squirm through this gate. And all of that apparently is based in fiction. None of that has been proved anywhere. And so what are we left with? Well, we're left with a picture of a camel going through a, the eye of a needle, which is a much more powerful picture anyway than a city gate that they have to crawl through. And so what is Jesus saying? He is presenting the picture that, that it is for a rich man impossible to enter into the kingdom of God because it is impossible for a camel to make his way through an eye of a needle. Now, that is difficult for the disciples. The disciples have a, have a difficult... It says in, the, in verse 26 that they were exceedingly astonished when Jesus told them that. Now, why is that? It's not really explained to us. Uh, but we do know from uh, extra-biblical literature that, that there was the impression among the Jews of those days that the rich were blessed by God, that there was a measure of God's faithfulness seen in a person his blessing resting on them in a person because of the amount of their possessions. So the rich were seen as uniquely blessed by God, and, and in some sense, that's a popular notion today. There are many large churches in our nation, some of the largest churches in our nation, that are built on that theology exactly, that, that, the, the rich are, that you are blessed by God with, with riches. And as Jesus presses that point home to his disciples, that it actually is difficult for the rich to enter into the kingdom of God. The, the disciples are left with this fundamental question. Uh, they are astonished, verse 26, and they ask, then who can be saved? If, if we are not saved by personal achievement, if, if the rich are not saved, then how can anybody be saved? And Jesus is answering that question. Jesus is addressing that question. And Christ doesn't come to do the things that man thinks he should do. Uh, the rich man thinks he should be able to earn his way into the kingdom of God by his own achievement. Christ doesn't come to affirm somebody in that position. Christ doesn't come to help a struggling people reach their full potential. Christ doesn't come to give and live a good example for people to imitate. He comes to shed his blood on the cross to redeem sinners from the guilt of their sin. So when you come to man who by nature is corrupt, who, who violates the law, and who in his heart worships idols, there is no hope for that man for salvation except through Christ. And Jesus is showing this man, there is no hope for you to come to me by yourself in your own strength. What is impossible for you, though, is possible with God. 
Christ has come to satisfy divine, satisfy divine justice, uh, to, to make that way for man possible. Jesus is directing his disciples away from themselves, away from man, and towards the Lord. Now, the disciples don't seem to understand that right away, and you actually even see it in Peter's response. Peter understands partially what Jesus is saying. So uh, the rich man goes away. It's impossible for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of God. Peter then turns to Jesus and says, See, we've left everything and followed you. We've left everything and followed you. That's Peter's response. Now, Peter, I think, is well-intentioned, but I don't think he's quite all the way there. Because Jesus gives this list of things that are forsaken. And you notice in verse 29 what he adds to it. There is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel. That is different than forsaking them yourself. There is, of course, the movement of asceticism. That is a reaction to materialism, which says the poorer I am, the better I am. If I can make myself poor, if I can become, uh, 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 if I can become a beggar for the sake of Christ, this is popular monastic theory in the Middle Ages, then I will be affirmed, then I will work my righteousness. It's the same problem as the rich young ruler, just on the opposite side of possession. One seeks to, uh, uh, to look to his possessions as something to be held on, something to be used to earn their own salvation, and the other is to forsake it all uh, for the sake of being better than, than somebody else. To live for Christ and the gospel's sake is to forsake all, uh, your status of rich or your status of poor, because God provides for you all of your work. Now, Jesus, as he's teaching this, he's saying, what you forsake in this life, you will receive a hundredfold in this life. Now, how does that make sense? Because not everybody who is a Christian has received a hundredfold what they gave up. It simply means that the value of being joined to Christ is far greater than anything that you will surrender for him. Some people have said that as you forsake mother and father for the sake of Christ, you are joined to the people of God. You're entered into this family where you have hundreds of mothers and fathers, spiritual brothers and sisters. And that's a possible way of explaining it. But, but at the very least, what we can say about it is that Christ is saying, whatever you give up for me, your reward right now will be far greater than anything that you surrender. You will have riches and wealth and relationships beyond your ability to comprehend. It may not be now or it may not be as you imagine because Jesus adds to that list that actually the Christian in his surrender and in his receiving gifts from God has persecution as part of it. That, that in giving up, persecution is, is part of the mix. And all of that is better than what they are giving up. The question that is first raised isn't about this life and the comforts that we have in this life. The, the question that the rich young ruler raised first was about eternal life. Now, the rich young ruler is long gone. He has returned to his big house, his, his big pile of money, and if he never changed, if he never repented from his position that he held when he left Christ here in Mark 10, it means that he perished in his pile of money. Because Jesus has plainly taught that you do not inherit eternal life in what you do. There is no one who is good. Your nature is corrupt. You have not done and you have not done it as you should, as the law testifies. And, and you must forsake all in your heart for the sake of Christ. Awaken to the treasure that you have in him, the forgiveness of sin uh, through faith in him. That's the lesson that Jesus has taught and the disciples are slow to see it. The rich young ruler didn't see it at all. And I wonder what we will do with it. Well, there's two things that we should take home from the theology of this lesson. The first thing, it should be a sober reminder for us that we should examine ourselves as to our first love. Uh, the place where this text begins 
is in a love for riches. It's really attacking materialism. And that's a good, that's a good challenge for you and me uh, because we are rich. Uh, make no mistake about it, everybody in this room is in the, uh, the more than, higher than the 50th percentile of rich people in the world. Isn't that the statistic that if you own a pair of shoes, that you're in the 51st percentile of rich people in all the world? So that means that everybody in this room is far beyond rich. And make no mistake, as the rich young ruler was self-righteous, we are prone to self-righteousness. It is in every one of our natures. Now, the question for the North American church in general and for Cliffwood Presbyterian Church specifically is this. Are you willing to be uncomfortable for Christ? And that is a real question for the North American church. Are you willing to be uncomfortable for Christ? If Christ demanded that you sell all your possessions and live in poverty for him, would you be willing to do it? Maybe a different way that might be more compelling because God doesn't ask us to surrender our riches and sell everything necessary. But what if this happened? What if your belonging to Christ meant that your riches would be taken away from you? Would you maintain fidelity to Christ? Would you profess his name publicly or would you cover it up so you could maintain the way that you live? See, I think rather than spending a long time justifying that it's not wrong to be rich, we should interact with that question instead. We should interact with the side of the question that asks, are we willing to give it all up? And in that way, riches is really only one example. There are many things that you can value more highly than Christ that you would be unwilling to give up for him. The question of this text could really be asked in another way. Is there something that you are not willing to give up in the service of Christ? Well, is that one thing that you're not willing to give up? That is, uh, that is the thing that is your idol the thing that is more precious to you than Christ. Now, it could be your riches. It could be your family. It could be your station. It could be your status. It could be your friendships. It could be anything like that. What will you not give up if demanded by Christ? Now, some of you, for some of you, being converted to Christianity is is closer in the rearview mirror than, than others. For some of us, we've, we've grown up in the church, but, but the new Christian, in the moments when, when God, by His Spirit, is sanctifying us, calling us closer to Himself, there is a, a time where we are filled with love for Christ. And all the things that Jesus of, is asking of the rich young ruler are plain to us in those moments. Yeah, of course I can't earn my salvation. I, my nature isn't good enough. I know no one's good but God alone. I'm, and when I look at his law, I, I see all the places where I have failed to live up to the commandments of God. And of course, I'm willing to forsake everything to follow Christ because of his great gift for me and the way that he laid his life down for me. But over time, that excitement and that enthusiasm can fade. That is recorded for us in in the letter of the seven to, of the Spirit to the seven churches, the first letter he writes is the church of Ephesus in Revelation 2. And, and what is the charge against the church in Ephesus? That they've lost their first love. They're, they're diligent to discern error and heresy, but they've, they've lost their first love. Has that happened to you? Have you lost your first love of, of God? Have you lost this wonder that you have over him, this desire to follow him wherever you go. I remember hearing it at seminary. At seminary, where men are being trained for gospel ministry, men would come and say, uh, I will not go to this place. I will serve the Lord anywhere, but I will not go I don't know, to Alaska. I, will, I won't go serve the Lord in, in Alaska. You hear it in people. 
I know God says this, but what about my job? Where will I get my food? You hear it in the walls of the church. We have invested so much to have a seat at the table. And if we say that, we will lose our spot. What is your first love? And don't give the easy answer. That's what the rich young ruler does. He is self-satisfied. Look at your life with sober judgment and ask yourself, what is my first love? Ask yourself that question before God and answer it before the God who knows all your thoughts, words, and deeds. Answer it honestly. Answer it reflectively. Examine yourself as to your first love. This text also uh, causes us to rejoice in hope of the glorious promise. When Jesus asked this man to forsake his riches, is Jesus trying to be mean to him? When Jesus asked this man to forsake riches, is he just saying, ah, I know the spot where he's going to fail. I'm going to ask him those things. I know where he's going to fall down, where he's going to look foolish. That's not what Jesus is doing. What, what is part of, of Jesus' answer? Part of Jesus' answer is that this man is holding on to something that is a far less worth than what Jesus is giving him. Jesus is pointing this man away from what he thinks is a treasure, pointing him to the true treasure. He's pointing him to himself. It's like a, a baby child who is satisfied with pureed food while the grown-ups around him are sitting down for a Thanksgiving dinner celebration. The child is, is satisfied with puree, but there's a feast around him. That is what we do when we hold on to our first love, when, when we fail to see Christ as our treasure. It's like the child who gets his first quarters. It's easy to impress a child who, who just has their piggy bank for the first time. All you have to do is give them a dime. And they think, well, they think they're Elon Musk, really, at that point. They think they could buy all the houses in Augusta uh, 10 times over. That's how they feel. But that's not who they are. That's not what the reality is. And, and, and you, you talk to little children about the expenses of your household, and you say to them, how much do you think it costs our family to, to put groceries on the table? And they, you know, the biggest number that they can imagine is like you know, $50 or something like that. Well, and then you tell them what it is, and it's like more money than they've ever made in their lifetime, and they can't even get their heads wrapped around it. And the reality is that when they start working, they will earn that every week. But, but they can't imagine it. They just think in terms of nickels and dimes and quarters. And the same thing is true for us when we hold on to these earthly treasures that are, that are, that, that, that are just so faded and tarnished in comparison to the treasure that we have in Christ. So when we look at our earthly treasures and hold on to those, we are the man who looks only to the earth without in considering this promised increase that Jesus gives. How great is the increase that Jesus promises when, it, when we lay hold to him, on him? You know, he's saying to you, don't hold on to these nickels and dimes. There is a treasure for you greater than you can imagine. A hundred times what you have now. Of course, not in the same way that we possess these things now. Surely in a way that we can't imagine now but of greater value than anything that we have. Those are the parables that he tells in other places, right? The, the pearl of great price, this, this, this field with a hidden treasure where, where everything is to be forsaken so that that thing can be possessed. Well, what is that thing? That thing is Christ. We have Christ. He is the treasure, and that is beyond the greatest treasure that we can imagine today. That's what this text is teaching us. So rejoice in hope of the glorious promise. The rich young ruler of this text, he's an, he's an accomplished man. Maybe he's even the envy of his town. But what his earthly riches, uh, but his earthly riches are actually his spiritual doom. He allows his earthly successes to blind him to what he actually needs, to blind him to what he actually can possess, Christ. Jesus tells him, Man is not good, and he does not do good. 
But if he forsakes everything and clings to Christ, eternal life is his. Reconciliation to God by the forgiveness of sin. And my dear brothers and sisters, that is worth one million times one million of all of the houses in Augusta, Richmond County. Let's pray together.